I'll bet you got something on your shirt. Yeah, they have to do zooming. Hi, we're actually all of Granada. Yeah, she's just Granada. Okay. They say it's Granada and... It's, it's hey, can you guys... Uh, so it seems like you guys can hear me, yeah? Hi, Rita. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, speed and clarity. Um, oh, yeah, so it's two... Oh, so it's two groups. Right, right, okay. We have, yep, Granada Hills has two teams. Right, okay, cool. Um, so, hi teams, uh, can you guys put on your camera for a minute just so we can test it and make sure that we can see you? Yay, hello, I'm glad that you guys could still present today even though you're not here in person. Um, so, uh, I guess you guys will probably be presenting from your own laptop instead of using mine. So um, I'll just move the Zoom screen over when it's your turn to present. So there's, Mark, there's two teams that could not make it today in person. Um, I'm like hearing double. Is it, is Are you hearing double? Yeah, I'm getting double and speech. So the, oh, weird. The cameras are getting double in the back. So the double is coming through from the two. Hmm. That's odd. Um, I guess. Yeah, because we, let's, I think let's turn off the 
this mic input. Okay. If that can do it. Um, here, mic. If that can do it. Here, um, but if I turn, if I turn that mic off, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, they can't hear me if, if I don't have this on is the problem. But I guess what I can do is as soon as, oh, but then because the judges will also need to ask questions. So I, I guess. I mean, I guess when they're giving their presentation of something matter, uh, they should still come through the system and then we'll hear them uh, and they shouldn't be a loop there. It'll just matter for the Q and A, I it'll guess, with the judges. For, it'll just matter for the Q and A, yeah. So I guess we'll ask the judges to come up here. I suppose. I mean, I can't think of another. I mean, it's just that this, this, this mic is going to pick them up, and then that mic is going to pick them up, which is why there's like oh. a five-second delay between those oh, two. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so then I guess is does this button turn it off? Okay. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> we can just turn the mic off. I'll just turn the mic off, I guess, once they're presenting. And then ask the judges to come up here. Or use or yeah, or that. I guess we can use this for yeah. the judges. And then this will not pick up the judges. Yeah. It just gets okay. Off the mic. So then when the judges are asking questions and they ask in the microphone. Well, I guess but if they're asking in the I mean, if they're asking in this microphone, yeah. we can turn off this microphone. Right? Yeah. So that would work. But right. then if we turn off this microphone and they're asking from this microphone, they still won't hear it though, right? Right, they need to hear it. Yeah, so. so they, they have to be up here still, right? Yeah, so the judges for, just for have to be, groups. yeah, for these yeah. for these groups. And then these mics need to be turned. I can, if, if you don't turn them off, I can be in back there. Okay. make that announcement too. Thanks so much for working uh, to figure this all out for us. Of Appreciate course, it. Of course, yeah. Absolutely.
tried to like just move it over to the other display, but now it's like hiding from me. And I can't find it. Uh, I just, is there a reason why you're not near it? No, so I'm gonna, I guess just switch to mirror. Yeah, that, that's your story is it's safer to share. Um, so then. Like Zoom is weird. You, you you just got muted right now. It would be weird because we're we're hearing you as well as this. So unless so, so Zoom needs to be muted until. This okay. Event. Um. So or I'll I'll ask. So everyone who's currently on Zoom, can you guys all make sure that you are muted unless you are actively presenting, so we don't get feedback. That includes us. And that will include us. Yes. Let me just. Mute, okay. Perfect, I'll just keep that there, I suppose, for now. Okay, and this is on, okay, awesome. Hi, everyone. <laughs> we could, I know it's the morning and I hate to do this, but I'm gonna make you guys do a little bit better than that. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yay, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who have not yet been inside of our building, Welcome to the California Nanosystems Institute at UCLA. It is so lovely to have students back in person again for the presentations. I'm so excited. I always, always love this competition every year. Um, it's just incredible to see where you guys start versus where you guys end up with all of these presentations. Um, and I'm sure this year will be no exception. So I'm excited to get started. Um, just first, uh, some housekeeping things before we get started. 
Um, so after these welcome remarks, we'll get started with the presentations. Um, we'll take a break after the first five, so we'll take a break at around 11.30. Uh, then we will go up to have lunch. Lunch will be upstairs on the sixth floor patio. So students and guests will be on the north side. Judges, you will be having lunch on the south side so that you guys can discuss all of the presentations. Um, please, uh, because UCLA just as of t this morning uh, changed their rules again, we're asking everyone to please keep your masks on at all times while you are indoors. Um, and that includes when you guys are presenting. Um, we request this obviously because COVID numbers are going up and we just wanna make sure that everyone's safe because it's a lot of people in an indoor space. Um, so we appreciate you guys uh, taking care in that regard. Um, then after lunch, we will all come back here. We'll have the award ceremony and then we'll say our goodbyes and it's gonna be a great day. Uh, before we start uh, with introducing the judges, uh, there's a couple of quick thanks I wanna give. Uh, first to our institute, to the California Nano Assistance Institute. Uh, we have so many people that work here behind the scenes to help set up everything for um, not just the competition as a whole, but these events and this final event especially. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone who works here at the Institute who had any part in helping to make today happen. Um, and also, uh, we wanna give an, an extra special thank you to uh, environmental research advocates who are, and Denise Afchen especially, who are sponsoring uh, the prizes for today um, and for their continued, uh, continued uh, sponsorship and care for all of the events actually that we do in the education program. I want to give them an extra special thank you very much. <laughs> and I know we'll be thanking them again at the end of all of the presentations and everything, but um, I want to give, uh, I want to be sure to give one big shout out and a big, big thank you to our mentors. Um, thank you to the mentors that are here today. It's so cool to see you guys. Yay! It means so much, I know to the students and definitely to us that you guys take so much time out of what I know are super crazy busy schedules for all of you uh, to be able to work with these students and uh, mentor them and give them this incredible experience that is uh, still exceedingly rare. Um, so I hope that you guys really enjoyed getting to work with the students and I hope you guys got to learn something too because it's also pretty rare for grad students to engage in the process of business and tech. So. Hopefully it was a fun and engaging experience all around. So with that being said, um, I'd like to give uh, a quick introduction to our judges. Um, and this is just in, uh, in no particular order other than uh, alphabetical. Uh, so our first judge is uh, Denise Afchen, who I mentioned earlier. She is the executive director and co-founder of Environmental Research Advocates. So hello, Denise. Next, we have Howard Coe, who is a principal at Morpheus Ventures and a frequent judge as well. So Howard, hello, and thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, next, we have, uh, I believe, a, a first-time judge for Nanovation, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. So uh, we have Nikki Lin, who is the Director of Entrepreneurship and Commercialization here at the CNSI. So Nikki, welcome. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Professor Sarah Tolbert, who, in addition to being the faculty director of the CNSI Education Program, is also, of course, a professor uh, in the Department of Chem and Biochem and also in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. So, Professor Tolbert, thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Sonia Luna, who is the executive director of the CNSI. So Sonia, thank you for being here. Uh, by first name. <laughs> tricky, tricky, I know. 
Um, Sarah, would you like to, to say some words before we start? In my life, I will. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I want to welcome you all here and um, just reiterate that this is one of the most exciting opportunities that I think in this program in general, our goal is to make science and in general and nanoscience in particular more interesting and exciting for students of all ages, um, high school, adults, everybody. Um, but I think that this is one of the most unique programs because this is one of the few cases where we really get to show people the tight connection between business and technology. And it's something that is intimate to the real workplace and totally lacking in most education systems, including through college. And so I'm incredibly happy that you have had the opportunity to see this connection and that it will inspire you as you go onward in your education. And that it will inspire you both to learn more about business and to learn more about science and to actually you know, maybe be a science major instead of a business major and then still go into business because I think that in many ways that's what the world needs. Um, so uh, I'm super excited to see all your presentations. Before uh, we begin, I want to just say a few things about the presentation. So the idea here is you're going to present and then we are going to be a shark tank which means our goal is to ask you hard questions. We are not trying to be mean, cruel. The whole idea of it is to ask hard questions and for you to have an opportunity to respond. So if you don't know the answer, don't panic and don't feel like you're a horrible person. Try to answer and if you have, none of you have any idea, Try to think on your feet and come up with something. And if what you come up with is not a perfect answer, don't stress about it. It's the process of experiencing this. And there's two other things that are really important. You are a team, and I strongly encourage you to answer questions as a team. And that means you can confer with each other briefly, you don't have a lot of time, about who is the best person to ask. I can just show you here. We've got like, you know, a real VC. He's gonna ask you questions about viable businesses. We've got some like real business people. They're gonna say, Does your, do your numbers in your spreadsheet work? I'm gonna be, is your science and technology actually real? Could you make this thing? So you're gonna sort of know from just who raises their hand what kind of question you're gonna get. Please don't have the one most vocal person answer every question. Sometimes the people who are afraid to talk have the greatest ideas. If you don't want to talk, tell somebody else, but please all be involved. Um, I can tell you when my graduate students go out and give talks at big conferences in front of high level people, the thing that always worries them the most is the questions because the talk they can control, the questions they have no idea what they're gonna get. But the answer is, you actually know your project better than most of the people asking you questions. And so you really do know the answer to these questions. So don't panic, speak to each other, and just come up with the best thing you can. And the biggest thing is don't feel bad if you don't make a perfect answer because the biggest thing is the process of learning how to answer questions. And that's why we make this half presentation, half question. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to go. I do just want to remind everybody, um, everybody is masking, but not everybody is masking fully. This is now a new UCLA rule, so your mask has to be over your nose and mouth because, boy, we want this to be an awesome event, a super event, <laughs> but not a super spreader event. So help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well said. Okay, uh, just I guess a, a few more things before we start. Uh, just a reminder of our prizes. Uh, first place team today will win $2,000 in classroom supplies. Second place team will win $1,000 in classroom supplies. And the third place team will win $500 in classroom supp supplies. Excuse me. All teams today will be getting uh, at least $100 in classroom supplies and you will all be getting a finalist plaque because I guarantee you 
even just getting to this point is really a phenomenal achievement. So even if you do not win first place, second place, third place, that does not mean that you did not do an excellent job. So I just wanna say that right off the bat. Um, and uh, I think all of our uh, presenters already know the order, but just for uh, the people who are viewing online, uh, this will be the order of our presentations. Again, after the, our fifth presentation, we'll be taking a brief break. And with all of our presentations, uh, each team will have five minutes to present and I will be uh, timing you. And I can give little hand signals to let you know if you have two minutes left, one minute left, et cetera, so I can help make sure that you guys are on track. And then we'll have about uh, five minutes of time for Q&A. Uh, just one quick note uh, for the judges. Uh, so two of our teams actually have to present on Zoom today. So uh, I will switch it over to Zoom when they are presenting. And then because of the logistics of the sound, if you all can come up here to ask your questions, because um, we have to use my computer mic, that would be great. All right, so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first team, which is uh, Save 2.0. So Save 2.0, if you guys wanna, wanna come up. whenever according to a variety of hospitality sources over 686 billion gallons of water are wasted by hotels every single year solely due to laundry machines if only there's a way that all this clean water could be saved and instead used for more humane purposes good morning everyone my name is Yasha Shaw Yanai Halperin Jordan McConney Jacob Ovedia, Ahmed Azaman. And we are Save 2O, an innovative washing machine attachment that filters and recycles H2O per every laundry cycle. How does it work? Save 2O will be attached to the back of the laundry machine. After a laundry cycle, the water from the laundry machine will travel via pipes to the filter. The filter will be an adsorption filter and will consist of powdered activated carbon media derived from coconut shells. The filter will also have a small concentration of silver nanoparticles for antimicrobial purposes. From there, the newly purified water will be stored in a tank before traveling back into the machine. If there is any water lossage during this process, a flow rate sensor will detect this and immediately transport water back into the tank. The flow rate sensor can also detect excess water in which a safety valve will lead it to the drain. Since common hospitality materials require hot water for an efficient wash, our product will be made with a thermos-like design, with industrial copper on the inside, a silicon rubber insulator in the middle, and PVC on the outside of the structure. Based on personal calls with these industries, hotels within our marketing area average a laundry water bill of $4 million annually, while cruise ships average a bill of $46 million. However, instead of paying for their expensive laundry water bill, these industries can now purchase our product for only 1% of this yearly bill. Our product costs us $1,300 to create, and we will sell the product direct to consumer for $6,000, thus having a gross profit margin of 78%. Because of our cost and efficiency, Save2O is able to save a million gallons per hotel every single year. Based on the number of Asian, African, and South American hotels, as well as the worldwide number of cruise ships, we expect our current market cap to exceed $8 billion, However, this market cap will increase as we venture into new markets. Based on Save2O's cash requirements, our investment needed for an initial three years of operations is $26 million. However, this cost is tentative as years two and three's gross profit may alleviate this cost. 
In year one, Save Fuel projects to sell 138 units and have a negative net profit. This year will be focused on prototypes and filing patents. In year two, Save Fuel projects to sell 1,388 units and have a $5 million gross profit. This year will be focused on providing quotes with our expanding clientele. In year three, Safe Toe projects to sell 13,888 units and have a $62 million gross profit. This year will be focused on cutting costs. From then on, Safe Tool will hopefully return our investment and sell up to 10% of the market by year six. This is our competitor matrix. Hydrofinity, one of the best modern laundry machines, uses 50% less water than the average washing machine. It, uh, it costs about $9,000 to $10,000. It uses clean water, but the wash cycle isn't as efficient. Tunnel washers, which are large industrial laundry machines, save 20% of the water used, but cost over $1 million. In addition, their cycles are not as efficient since water must clean more clothes compared to regular washers. At Save 2.0, we recycle 95 to 99% of um, water while costing $6,000. And instead of sacrificing efficiency for the environment, Safe Tool will be using all the required water, both clean and hot. As a result of the matrix, Safe 2.0 is a disruptive innovation, or nanovation, as you are substantially cheaper, faster, and more efficient than our competitors, by a huge margin. It is even possible to attach a Safe 2.0 machine to the back of a hydrofinity machine, or even a tunnel washing machine truly showing how safe to owe can really save the globe. Thank you. Okay, very uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, first question. What's the lifetime of this device, right? Uh, can it be attached forever? Does it need to be replaced? Are there replacement parts? Yes, so the lifetime of our product will be around, um, it, w it would last basically forever because of all the materials. However, the materials will need to be replaced um, at a different sorts of time. For example, the filter will need to be replaced every six months and um, the pipes may have some corrosion, so the, uh, the pipes also may need to be re replaced. However, that would take around 50 years or even 60 years for that to happen. Thank you. Okay, so I, I thought you're always gonna get the tech questions for me. So um, washing machines wash, and the idea is they take all the dirt of the clothes and they put it into the water. So what is the, so your filter is mostly activated carbon, and can that effectively absorb the large quantity of stuff that is gonna be coming off of these dirty sheets and towels? Yes. And, and what, what is basically, what is the capacity? And then also, what about the soap? Are you getting the soap out? Are you leaving? So could you just talk about a little more of the tech de details? Yes. So our filter, um, according to a scientific research paper, it filters out pathogenic bacteria, which is the bacteria that um, these textiles that hotels have will commonly come in contact with. It can filter those out with a 97 to 99% synthesis after only three minutes. And so um, activated carbon is also known to filter out detergent as well. And so within five to 10 minutes, the entire um, water will be clean and will ready to be used in another cycle. Um. And is that based on like, a, a, have you calculated like adsorption amounts and how much, what is the adsorption capacity of the carbon and what is the amount of soap you're likely to have in your water? So the amount of soap that we're likely to have in our water would be maybe around 5% um, of the amount of water there is. Now it depends on the different type of laundry machine, um, how much detergent there will be. So it's around 5% of the um, materials that are in the washing, as well as the, uh, much the amount of activated carbon that we are using is compared to the amount of activated carbon an aquarium tank used to filter out those things. However, we will use a little more because s aquariums don't necessarily filter out almost everything. And so that's basically how our filter works. Maybe I missed this, but um, you said that the replacements every six months or whatever. Yes. 
so did you did you uh, address the added costs or the cost to a company for for these replacements and then did you also add in training of the of the technicians and uh, turnover of that can you go by that again Yeah. Uh, so we're we, we're going to be switching the filter out every six months. We did not include that in our presentation, but it will be such a small amount of money that it won't matter as much because the amount of money they're going to be saving is going to be much higher than the amount of money they're going to be spending every six months. But your clients will be interested in that. The yes. added cost once you get to that. Um, the cost of our, we actually calculated the cost of how much our filters would cost. The filters cost us around $25 to create, and we will sell the filters also direct to consumer whenever the hotels need it for $350. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. How did you, uh, what drew you to this product to, to create this, this, uh, this product? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So I'm a big Star Trek fan. That's, th that's who I am. <laughs> And even our last year's idea was also based on Star Trek. So this um, product was originally for um, recycling the water within the showers, as in Star Trek there was something called sonic showers, which don't use water to clean. And so w showers are basically too hard to do this because you would have to drill into the sh whole shower and change the entire thing. And so laundry machines were the easiest applicable place to have this product. I have two quick questions. Um, in your five, six, towards the end of the horizon that you showed in your sort of highway you had. Yes, the roadmap. Yeah, you said, in, uh, I don't remember if it was your five or six, but you said you were going to cut costs. Mm -hmm. Why are you cutting costs? Why aren't you controlling costs? So the costs that we have are b a bit expensive considering that um, these companies don't know us. However, once we have partnerships with these companies, the cost will decrease the production cost. And this is what I'm talking about and the cost will decrease. That's, that's our b si uh, okay. reason behind this. Okay, <coughs> all right, I understand what you're saying now. So what you're saying is the cost per unit is going to decrease, yes. correct? And the cost of the product after the first three years of operations, once we get more settled into the market, we project that to increase. However, the first three years of operation, we want to beat these competitors that you see here all because right. If you take the tunnel washers and basically make it the same amount of washing pr for hydrofinity, that's going to be around $1,300. And so we want to beat those costs. That way we don't lose our clientele within the first three years. Okay. I think um, when you think through these in the future, you need to think about cost per unit. Yeah, cost I, I per th yeah it's the cost per unit you're talking about, I think. Yeah, our, our current cost right. per unit is back here. It's it costs us thirteen hundred dollars yes, to create. I understand. And it's um about nine hundred and fifty four dollars for the raw materials. It is three hundred for the manufacturing, and it's fifty five dollars for the shipping. I understand. You have the concept of fixed and variable costs. Mm -hmm. So I won't go into the detail here, but at a, in a later project, look into fixed and variable costs, and I think you'll start to see what I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. We are Banana Framers, and we are Saturn family. I'm Rachel. I'm Nikki. I'm Sophia. I'm Katie. And I'm Darren. So our product, Banana Frames, combats the common problem of glasses breaking, specifically children's glasses, which are super, and I mean super inadequate. In fact, a massive 23% of children break their glasses in just the first year, which is super costly to parents and expensive to replace. The solution? Banana Frames. 
Our glasses are lightweight, flexible, and corrosion resistant, meaning that your kids won't be experiencing any discomfort or skin irritation. You see, plastic and titanium glasses frames are simply ineffective. One of our major competitors are carbon fiber glasses, and they also use nanoscience. And as you can see here, they do check off a lot of the boxes on our chart. However, we the nanoframers have a tiny, tiny little secret, literally, and that's our carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are much lighter and much stronger. They're, more su they're superior because of their enhanced stability and more organized structure. Even though carbon fiber is cheaper, we're only using 4% of carbon nanotubes in our glasses frames, which makes our product much cheaper, much more durable, and 20 times as strong. Our glasses are made up of a nanocomposite of polymer and carbon nanotubes. Because of the carbon nanotube's nanostructure, this enhances the frame's durability and strength. So carbon nanotubes are rolled up sheets of single-layered carbon atoms that form a hexagonal structure. Because of the strong sp2 covalent bonds between the carbon atoms, this results in really high tensile strength. Let's just look at this graph. We can see that carbon nanotubes are over 100 times stronger than stainless steel and other material used for glasses frames. Not only this, but carbon nanotubes are very flexible, which means that this allows kids to bend and play with their glasses. Because of these properties, carbon nanotubes undergo a reversible process that results in fantastic energy dissipation and shock absorbing properties. The nanocomposite will consist of a matrix and a filler in which thermoplastic polyurethane is the matrix and carbon nanotubes are our filler. To produce the nanocomposite, we will be using solution mixing in which the carbon nanotubes will be added to a solvent and the thermoplastic polyurethane will be added to allow dispersion of the carbon nanotubes. After magnetic stirring and ultrasonic baths dissolve the mixture, the nanocomposite will be molded, which will leave us with our nanocomposite glasses. The global children's eyewear market is currently worth $10.5 billion, capturing just 1%, we can generate over $100 million in revenue. Currently, the market is projected to continue growing due to the global increase in myopia in children. Current competitors in the market are companies such as Luxottica and Johnson & Johnson. We plan to compete with our competitors by offering a high quality but affordable glasses frames to compete with brand name frames and cheap frames. We plan to start our business in Waco, Texas due to the low, uh, local advantages, such as lower operation costs and a large potential customer base. Furthermore, we are selling our glasses at $50 per frame with an $8.31 cost to produce, which gives us an 83% profit margin, which is 20% greater than the median of 61%. As an eyewear company, we have many visions of our goal for our first few years. In our first year, we need $372,000 in order to finish developing and testing our nanoframes. And then we also need to apply for our provisional patent, which gives us one year of protection uh, as we fundraise, advertise, and reach out to our audiences at the time. Then we launch in our second year, which will cost us a tad under $700,000. We aim to sell and uh, produce about 35,000 units we hope to uh, apply for a utility patent, which gives us 20 years of protection for our design and technology. We also hope to gather feedback from the medical professionals and customers as they continue to buy our frames from the optometrists. And that takes us into our third year, uh, which brings our profit to a million, uh, a million dollars. At this point, we hope to double the amount of units that we sell, to expand it into international markets like Canada, and introduce uh, customizable frames in order to make them more appealing for both parents and children alike. Our company's mission is to ease the common concern of glasses breaking by utilizing nanotechnology to create a more durable and non-irritating glasses frame. We aim to improve the lives of children whose glasses should not impede on their active lifestyle or comfortability. Thank you for listening to our presentation. I'll go ask the first question. Um, so as you were presenting, I thought, wow, these eyeglasses could last a really long time. And I thought, but people like to change their glasses every year. So did you look at the time, say a child wears their pair of glasses, and by the way, last time I checked, 
kids grow and so do their heads and so that means they would have to have new glasses. So I'm wondering how often glasses in kids are, are really changed because they're growing, their eyesight is changing, and whether the durability makes a difference here. Okay, so the main reason why we're choosing to make ours durable for children is since children grow, they're going to repeatedly need to buy our glasses, right? However, parents are going to be hesitant to re purchase the same types of glasses as they break before their child's head grows. So this establishes brand loyalty from a young age, and they will continue buying it until their head reaches maturity. Um, from what is the thought process of actually selling the selling a product? Are you going direct to consumers, or are you going through a retailer or, or an optometrist? So we plan on distributing our frames through um, optometrist offices um, because over, I'm sorry, um, because over 60% of uh, uh, frames or frame sales are through optometrist offices and the other through retail or online. And so uh, we're more likely to sell our frames by distributing them into uh, di like singular um, offices rather than trying to compete in larger retailers. And so that fifty dollars sell sell price point is that to to, to the optometrists or to actually the consumers themselves? Uh, the optometrists. Okay, and and obviously there's an the, the, there's a the lens component, right? You know, type of thing. So have you guys looked at what the total cost is? Um, you know, for a, a a pair of glasses utilizing your technology. Um, this includes lens, right? Uh, does this include lenses into it, or just the frames? It, to the consumer, have you looked okay. at what the total cost is to a, a parent? Okay, to the consumer, usually uh, glasses cost around two hundred, over two hundred dollars, depending on the types of frames and their prescription. So we calculate that if um, we use the average markup of 200% for optometrist offices, and then assume that they use single lenses, which is like one type of like nearsightedness, we would cost around $200 or a little bit over, which is around near the middle mid range or the lower range of glasses. Okay, hello, great presentation. Thank you again. Um, so the frames themselves are very durable, hard to break, right? And this it may be a question that you looked into. I'm just looking to see what the results were. If you did uh, the lenses, right? Mm -hmm. Those can still break, right? Did you look into any ways to lessen the fragility of, of, of that component? So no, we haven't looked specifically into the lenses. I think something that could be really interesting for us to pursue, maybe as our business grows, is maybe elastic lenses. I think that'd be really cool. Um, but we haven't specifically looked into the lenses because our business only produces the frames of the glasses. Okay, so a comment and a uh, question. I, first off, I can just verify as someone who now has teenagers but had small kids with glasses that um, they do break them before the year is out mm -hmm. and before they <laughs> needed yeah, to actually get a new pair. Um, but so my question is always is going to be the technical one. In the, a pure composite form, the mechanical properties of your carbon nanotube composites are superior to a carbon fiber. But glasses have all sorts of weird failure points. They break at certain flex points. Mm -hmm. Basically, is the, the strengths of the carbon nanotube composites in the right place to really improve the longevity of glasses? So for example, you got a pair on the floor there that's broken at the nose piece. <laughs> that's a pretty common place for them to break because they flex them and that's a weak point. If your if your carbon nanotubes give you tensile strength, mm -hmm. that is pulling, mm -hmm. the flexor strength, which is what happens at the nose piece, is not going to help you. Yeah. So have you looked into whether it's the right kind of strengthening? So I'll answer this question. Um, when we were doing our research to look into how solution mixing was going to work, we got um, research papers showing us how the carbon nanotube nanocomposite works under pressure. And so in those images that we saw in the paper we, from the Singapore University, the carbon nanotubes are all clumped together. Like imagine like a bowl of spaghetti. And so because of that clumping, the carbon nanotubes, they aren't vertically aligned. So they should be able to withstand any pressure at any specific point. Pressure and clumping are actually different um, types of mechanical definitions. Okay. Well, one thing is dispersed in the thermoplastic polyurethane. The thermoplastic polyurethane is going to be very stretchy, and so I do think 
it's going to be very elastic, so it should be able to withstand at any um, breaking point. Thank you. Thank you. Loving all the puns, by the way. Very much appreciate that. All right, our next group is uh, Carbon Compost. Good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Sabaos. I'm Mariah Rubio. I'm Diego Rivera. And I'm Ryan Dawson. And, and we, we are Nano Mourn. Quick question. How much food do you think is wasted each year in the United States? Did you know that 108 billion pounds of food is wasted each year in the U.S.? That equates to $408 billion wasted every year. That's nearly 40% of yeah, of landfills flow, um, outflowing, overflowing. So how do we solve this? We solve this by composting. Composting will significantly reduce, yeah, I'm um, sorry, methane emissions, and it will also combat climate change. So we conducted a survey of 91 people and found that over 80% of the sample does not compost. Of that sample, only about 15% fully knew what composting was. From the feedback we got, we found that people do not compost because they believe it smells or it just takes too long. This is a problem because composting is vital to reducing, um, reducing the amount of food in landfills and reversing the effects of climate change. So how do, we so how do we solve this and how do we get people to compost? Through the carbon compost. The carbon compost is a supplemental accessory to outdoor compost bins, which aids the composting process and eliminates odor from the compost itself. It uses a carbon act activated carbon filter with inside the, the, the carbon or the, the flap of the, the, the compost bin. And the way what it does, it, is, it absorbs any unwanted odors from, the, from the, the compost itself. So how does it work? The way this works is through using activated carbon. And the specific activated carbon that we are using, the, we need a 0.7 to 2.5 nan uh, nanometers of uh, poured poor size distribution through our activated carbon. So uh, activated carbon is a very versatile and excellent absorption for our carbon, our carbon compost. So this is our target starting audience. We, schools are a major goal for us because we hope to teach the younger generation to be more sustainable and open-minded. And it's important to teach them to be, to be more sustainable because that way we can reduce the amount of plastic plastic contamination in our soil. While well, finding competitors, it was difficult due to our uniqueness. However, we have found three competitors listed up there. They are highly priced compared to their size. However, our project is aimed to be affordable, versatile, and effective to the general public. So this is our plan for our first few years. Currently, we're in the development phase where we will be improving the technology and making it more efficient. After we accomplish some of our major goals, like getting a patent, 
we will jump to product release and we will create a larger revenue by doing a yearly filter subscription and cultivating a new market by working further with schools to, to continue with student outreach. So this is our cost evaluation. We are looking for a funding request of $1 million. This is where our money will be going to for the next couple of years as seen on screen. Our first few years we'll be looking to uh, test out the market and to uh, make our product efficient if needed. If not, we'll be um, filing a patent. Our main goal here is to maintain our, our customers and our, our consumers to our um, yearly subscription of our carbon filters. So join us on our journey to combat climate change and eliminate food waste throughout the US. Join us with the carbon compost. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I have two questions, um, and they're both related to money, but one has to be related to tech. So is there a capacity limit of your activated carbon, and will that need to be replaced? So are you going to fill it up with stinkiness? And then the other thing... <laughs> scientific term. <laughs> scientific term there. <laughs> the, the other thing is, in your business plan, I didn't see any personnel. Like, I saw supplies and stuff. Who's going to do this? And and I can tell you as somebody who, you know, runs a research group, I, I spend all my money paying graduate students, and graduate students get paid a pittance on the actual world scale, and so that might be a significant underestimate. So I can answer the question on what we're going to do about uh, the the capacity of the carbon filters. So our plan is to actually uh, have have our, our carbon fil filters be replaced after. Uh, 12 to 18 months of being used throughout, throughout just use of being used in the carbon, uh, the compost. And the, w the way we do this is we do plan on selling to consumers just the filters itself after they uh, buy our product. And then we'll go to Diego for our, um, our cost for uh, paying people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually, uh, we actually had something for this. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, hold on. Yeah, so as seen here, we have our raw materials, rent, um, pan costs, market study, one-time costs, or the annual costs. We are looking to uh, put them as a, I think we, oh, we have a special? Oh, yeah, huh. sorry, sorry, my bad. So this is going to be, our, this is how we're going to be paying them. Base salary, dep depending on their position, we have our chief executive officers, our science officers, our chief operating officer, our scientists, and our administrators administrative supporters. So, I, so yeah, this is on screen now. If you want. Uh, the reasoning for not having them on the same slide is that you wouldn't be able to see the, the numbers from our other, our other costs because of the, the high expenses from paying uh, salaries. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, it's interesting. Did, uh, did you float this by kids in your school? How many? How many of you actually compost in your homes or at school? Uh, I do. My whole family does. And we did ask students and teachers around the school from all our classes. We asked our friends to help with it. And you found that, that there widespread composting among your teachers and, and friends? It was mostly from their families. But we did have a few who actively composted. And would they benefit from a product allowing them to, you know, spending <coughs> for a family to to spend the hundred and whatever it was for a unit, would that be beneficial to a family, did you feel, or to your, or to the school, or to the students? So it wasn't included in the slides, but we did ask that too, and majority of the survey did agree that they would be interested in it. Great. Uh, this slide, as well as the other slides, um, have you guys considered the marketing and sales cost associated with uh, selling, are you selling through direct consumers? Or are you selling, do you plan to sell through Target, Walmart, or whatnot? Yeah, we're planning on, s um, like throughout later in our years, when we're like, f when we uh, have everything set, we uh, we plan on ha um, selling to giant retailers. So yeah, like what you said, like Target, Walmart, industries like that, companies. Just as a FYI, um, your $25 margin, is probably not sufficient uh, to be able to 
shoulder the cost associated. They typically take between 30 to 50 percent, if not more, right? A and so you're going to be selling at a basically a loss. Either that, or you're, you you got to take into account sales and marketing costs. And nowhere on this slide on salary, there's a sales guy in there. Somebody's got to sell, right? Unless it's your, it's your CEO, which is fine too. Um, but somebody's got to be able to sell and market uh, your product because this is ultimately a consumer product. So something to keep in mind for when you're looking at costs. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, judges, are you all ready to go? Yes? Okay. Hi, I'm Chelsea Bassina. I'm Lucina Ganesian. I'm Anna Galim. And I'm Diego Aguilar. And we're the Cloud Kit from Valencia. The shrill of their sirens, the flashing red lights, Nothing will deter them, neither day nor night. It's arriving on scene and seeing joy in the eye, knowing they are safe because the firemen arrived. Firefighters are real life superheroes, risking their lives day after day to help others. But when push comes to shove, who is there to help the firefighters? That's where we come in. We have created an innovative device designed to give firefighters the reassurance and aid they deserve. In the line of duty, firefighters are exposed to a number of chronic carcinogens, which are substances that are capable of causing cancer. The CLAD kit addresses the need to be able to efficiently identify carcinogens found in contact with firefighter skin. Now, we know what you may be thinking. Don't firefighters already have personal protective equipment that shields them from these carcinogens? Unfortunately, their safety regulations do not guarantee full protection against these substances. This side? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the line of... I'm Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, are a class of common carcinogens that firefighters often come into contact with. These particles are incredibly dangerous as they increase the risk of cancer development with prolonged exposure. Our tests will detect uh, three common carcinogens, benzene, lead, and arsenic. To start, benzene is a common organic chemical, chemical compound that firefighters are often exposed to. Benzene makes up a large portion of the 40,000 micrograms of PAHs in per cubic meter of air in a fire environment, which is 200 times above safety levels set by OSHA. To detect benzene, we are using the principle of fluorescence, or the phenomenon where a wavelength of light hits a specific particle, and in return, the particle emits a wavelength of light at a lower energy. We are going to retrieve the data of the wavelength and send it to our app via cable where the amount of benzene will be calculated, displayed, and recorded. In order to detect arsenic, our test will have a color metric test strip that is adhered to the bottom of the benzene fluorometer. The test strips will be fabricated using a silver coordination polymer called silver BTC, which is a metal organic framework that can detect arsenic concentrations as low as 10 parts per billion. And lastly, our kit will test for lead. We will be utilizing sodium rhodesonate as an active chemical. On its own, sodium rhodesonate is normally an orange color, but when it comes into contact with lead, it can turn purple with as little as 50 parts per billion. The first step to operate a product is for the user to wipe a small area on their body, turn out gear or equipment, and combine it with water. On the fluorometer, the user will pin the disposable arsenic and lead test strips to the front side using the folding plates. The clad kit is now ready for testing. To initiate the benzene detector, a button is pressed to activate the photodiode and LED. A mobile device with our app will be connected to the fluorometer to, uh, to calculate and display the amount of benzene detected in the sample. If there is arsenic or lead present in the water, a reaction with the active chemicals on the test strip will occur, resulting in a visible color change on the respective test strip. There are other forms of PAH and carcinogen detection sold around the world, but none of them are specialized for firefighters, and very few are easy to use for your average individual. This includes the AIMS test, which is a test intended for the identification of carcinogens 
by looking for gene mutations in bacteria. The AIMS test, however, is very expensive, costing up to $800 per test and can take weeks to get results, while our product will only take a few minutes at most. On the business side of things, we will utilize the first six months on refining and prototyping our product while establishing connections with local fire stations through Diego's connections. In the second six months, we will start producing about 10 kits per month and approximately 900 resupply packs will also be produced, although this number is subject to change due to the demand of fire stations. In year two, we will expand our production rates to 15 kits per month and produce about 30 resupply packs per kit sold. We will also file to obtain a patent this year. And then in year three, we hope to produce about 20 to 25 kits per month and yeah, and expand our range to other customers. Um, here are our employees. We plan to start with four employees um, in the first year and then we'll get another one in the second year. And we want to gradually increase their pay by 3%. To create one fly kit, it will cost about $338 and it will cost $45 to create, or it will cost $20 to create a refill pack. We will sell the fly kit at $575 and the refill packs at $45. In order to make profit, we predict to make $1,061,676 within the first three years. And the first three years may be slow, but it will be rewarding even time. The beauty about the clad kit is that it isn't exclusive to firefighters, but rather anyone who comes into contact with smoke or combustion. Thank you. Um, okay. So in terms uh, of detectors, um, you've talked a lot about sensitivity, like how low an amount they can detect. But what about selectivity? That means there's a lot of junk in the air. Can your test distinguish between the stuff that's really harmful to the firefighters and the stuff that is not so harmful but might produce a similar signal? So for at least the benzene part, the fluorescence of benzene is about, or to activate the fluorescence of benzene, it is about 255 nanometers wavelength, and it will release uh, approximately 278 nanometer wavelengths of light in return. So, our our we are going we are we will use a silicon carbide diode, photodiode, in order to pick up that specific range of light. So I think the issue is that almost everything emits in the UV. Like all the crap of the universe fluoresces in the UV. <laughs> so um, it, is there any data that suggests, and, and maybe the other things that emit at that wavelength are also sort of hazardous, but um, maybe some of them are not. So do you have a plan to make sure your detectors detect only the, that they're accurate in determining the most hazardous stuff. Uh, that's what we will spend the first six months in prototyping and calibration. Two questions. Um, first is, if they detect anything, what are they going to do about it? Are you providing a solution to be able to you know, help them solve the situation, or is it just purely for detection? We, this device is purely for uh, detection, but uh, as we said before, we will be recording the amount of benzene and if there is traces of arsenic and lead. So if there is a list of, let's say, for two weeks total time, they are exposed to a large amount of benzene or other carcinogens, then they should go see a specialist. But if they remain under the under safety levels, uh, then they should be fine. So, and go going back to the slide where the, there was a cost slide. So, are, are you saying that your selling price to the the, the fire stations was five hundred seventy-five dollars? Yes. And your cost is. For that $575 sale is 
37. Yes. So that percent profit doesn't uh, compute. So you should be taking the, the, th the difference, dividing, so 575 divided by 337 there is 200 and call it 40, something like that. Divide that by 575. That's your, that's your profit. So you want to think about kind of whether or not you're going to be unit economics positive. You have to take into sales, I think, uh, as with comments on other uh, presentation, you, should, you, you guys should take a look at what the selling costs are, not just what the bills of material costs are uh, when you look at actual profit margin. How many firemen typically work in a fire department in a f one firehouse? Well, that will actually depend on how many firefighters are called onto duty in a fire. I actually attempted my own structure recently. There are about 20 to 30 firefighters per uh, fire. Fire, fire, oh, like a fire response. Yeah. Okay. So I'm wondering, are these test kits, are they taking care of one fire person? I will say fire person. Um, or are they shared among multiple people? Because I, I, your scaling seems to be a little low. Um, so yeah, that's up to the user. Uh, for the first year, we intend to reach out to individual firehouses and they will share the tests because each kit will come with 24 tests. So whoever, they can use it as needed. Okay, so are you telling me that the 24 strips would be shared? That might be for one fire run. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, hey. That's our time for the first. Oh, Yeah, of course. I, I just want to say that this is a timely topic. We have a, there's a graduate student in our department who just finished his PhD and is now become the head of a new firefighter research center that the whole research center is focusing on addressing just this topic of what are firefighters exposed to. So the community is converging with you and trying to solve this very problem. All right, so our next team is uh, Clarity and I believe if I'm remembering correctly, that Clarity is uh, one of our Zoom teams. Is that correct? Team leader in Clarity, yes. Okay, so uh, I will have them present from their own computer. Go to full screen. All right, so Clarity, you guys are up. Are you all uh, ready to go? All right. Um, I don't know. Can you guys uh, just speak into the into your uh, computers to make sure we can hear you? Can you guys hear us? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yes. Okay. Great. Can we share our slides? I will. Out of the. There we go. That's, that's good enough, I guess. Okay. Uh, so whenever y'all are ready, uh, y'all have five minutes, and uh, you guys can go ahead. Do we, uh, do we share our slides, or? Oh, yes. Uh, please share your slides. Uh, it says it's disabled by, um, by host. Oh, let me, uh, let me fix that. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Oh. You ready to go? Yep. Yep, go ahead. 
I'm Andrew. I'm Shant. I'm David. I'm Justin. And I'm Carlos. And we're Project Clarity. So what is clear cutting? Clear cutting is the practice of uniformly cutting down all the trees in a forested area. Clear cutting has destroyed 42.2 million, hecta million hectares between 2001 and 2020. While clear cutting is a very effective logging practice, it has a variety of negative effects on the environment. Clear cutting can result in runoff. As a forested clear cut, it's no longer able to hold onto water during rainstorms, which results in runoff. Water runs off the surface of land and collects dirt and particles such as silt and clay. As these particles run off into lakes and rivers, um, large particles are not water soluble, so larger particles sink while smaller particles stay suspended. Clear cutting can have a variety of impacts on the environment. For one, it decreases light penetration, which, re which results in less photosynthesis in aquatic plants, which in turn reduces food supply for fish. It also interferes with navigation, resulting in um, harder, which results in less hunting, less breeding, and more migration troubles. It also lowers albedo as darker surfaces, such as turbid waters, absorb more sunlight, um, impacting global warming. This shows how there's an environmentally, there's a need for an environmentally friendly, sustainable solution to turbidity. To counter turbidity, we need a coagulant. A coagulant destabilizes the particles that are in suspension due to Brownian motion, which is the motion that's caused by the thermal energy of the water. Coagulants, um, coagulants work by introducing small, highly charged particles into the water that neutralize the charges on the particles in suspension. This then leads to flocculation, which is the process by which the particles congregate into bigger and bigger clusters, eventually leading them to be denser than water and sink. The plant we base our product on is Marguerite Hardiscodia, which is part of the Philanthesy group of plants. It is a common plant that can be found in the Ivory Coast. For the extraction of Margaritaria discodia, all that is needed to do is to crush the seeds of the fruit. The seeds contain galactomannins, which is a polysaccharide and can act as a coagulant. We chose Margaritaria discodia as our coagulant over gypsum and aluminum sulfate, which are already major competitors in the market, due to how it is harvested, making it an organic solution with no lasting environmental effects, effects on the environment. Uh, opposed to gypsum, for example, which is mined and also lingers in water after use. Bloom sulfate is also a weaker competitor to Margaritaria discodia because of its non-handleability. And both gypsum and aluminum sulfate contain sulfate within them, which is harmful to the ecosystems over time. And both are non-renewable, which makes a Margaritaria discodia the better solution. Our product also contains the service, and we will be conducting a simple on-site optical measurements to determine the um, turbidity contents in the water so we can accurately use a strong concentration of our product to counter the turbidity. Um, to spread the galactomannins evenly, and spread our product evenly, we'll be using a boat in which a propeller connected to the motor will spread the galactomannins outward. And in smaller bodies of water, um, this process can be aided through manual mixing. And even in some cases, the current of the water will naturally be enough to spread the product by itself. So as Shan said, we're going to have to account uh, for our personnel as we are a service. So we're going to have to account for workers, managers, and our executive officers. We're also going to have to account for our one-time expenses, which are going to be our vehicles, such as our vans and trucks and boats, and also our machines. We're also going to have to account for our raw materials, which is our actual plants, as well as fuel for our boats and our transportation methods. We're also going to have uh, other expenses, such as our rent for our offices, our factories, and our storage units. And finally, we expect our expenses to be about $1 million within the first year, but then in the following years, increase to about $2 million. We have many important milestones for our progression. In year one, we want to acquire Margaret Tyre Discoda from Africa for research and development purposes of our prototype, and also apply for EPA certification so that we can legally use our product from the environment. We would also apply for grant and loans to fund our expenses. By year two, we want to use these funds to build a factory and headquarters so we can mass produce and market our product, along with start marketing our product to government organizations. By year three, we want to create our own farm of Margaritara Discodia and open up our company to non-government organizations and anyone else interested in buying our product. And lastly, um, we conducted an experiment and we, to simulate the um, turbidity in water, we use slip, which is a water and clay suspension and we use guar gum as our coagulant since it contains galactomannan, just like the Margaritaria discordia fruit that we're using, giving us an accurate representation of how effective our product will be. And as you can see in the video, as the time goes on, the clay particles are separating from the water and going um, to the floor more and more. 
And remember, with Project Clarity, it's, it's your water, water and our fight. fight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, yeah, so, so judges, if you could come up here to ask your question since the mic is just connected to my computer. Um, I don't think I saw a uh, how much you're charging. What the you know, how, how much are you selling the 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 product for? Uh, so within our first year, we plan to sell our product for about seven thousand six hundred dollars, uh, and then build off of that uh, based on uh, the body of water and how much water there is and how much debris we need to fix within that body of water. Yeah, and, and to add, we have like we have a rate of um, every every gallon of water will cost us uh, two dollars to treat, and yeah, we, yeah we yeah we need two dollars to treat every gallon. Yeah, and for our product, the price is a little bit flexible. We have like a starting rate, and then based on the size of the lake or river that we're treating, the price would increase. So there's no like just set price that would be consistent for every um, one that we're treating. So take that as a as a unit economics, right? So if it costs you two dollars uh, per gallon to treat, how much are you how many uh, how much are you going to charge per gallon of water to be treated? Um. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, two dollars for every gallon of water that we're going to be treating it. So that's that's what you're going to sell it for. Sorry. How much? How, so did it cost you two dollars, or did it cost your customers two dollars? It's going to cost our customer two dollars. And how much does uh, it cost you to treat every gallon? Um, it would, we we would be able to treat um. It would be about, uh, I think, about 50 cents for every gallon uh, that yeah. we're going to treat, uh, just based on uh, our plants and also transportation. And raw materials. And raw materials. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, got, I have two questions. The first one, um, $2 seems way too high because a lot of bodies of water are millions of gallons of water. So um, I don't know if you've thought about what the kinds of things that actually need to be treated. So if you can comment on that, that's the first one. The second one is you said that your compound is biodegradable, but are there secondary environmental impacts? Like who's going to biodegrade it and are they going to make a bloom of something bad while they're biodegrading it? Um, to answer your first question, for the two dollars, um, that's gonna be what it would cost for first year. And first year, we're only using that for like uh, that's just gonna be our base number. But in our future years, like second and third year, especially third year, we will be starting our own um, Margaret Margaret Descodia farm and biz business. So we could probably get the price down over time. But the first year will be a little high since we have to import all of the product, and we're using the majority of that product for um, research and development. In the, in the first year. And then, and then for our um, uh, the biodegradability biodegradability question, uh, we actually chose Margaritari Discodio specifically because of it because of its uh, lack of a change in pH, its a uh, lack of secondary effects. Like you said, it doesn't have it doesn't have anything that would um, harm any standard uh, environment mm -hmm. it, because of its uh, poly polysaccharide build and the the lactamannans found within it is the completely natural and non harmful. And we also looked at secondary effects such as eutrophication and algal bloom that could have occurred from putting stuff into these bodies of water. And Margaret Margaret Discodia was like consistently the best in those fields and would have a very low environmental impact on its lakes. But again, we'll also be uh, we'll also be conducting more research in our first year just to make sure um, that our product is completely safe long term too. Yeah, that was like part of our milestone in the first year. We're going to really be focusing on research and development to make sure that like we have every little um, problem associated with the environment like fully in check. Especially so we can get the EPA certification. Yeah. Okay, so it's actually been tested in, in those environments. Yes, yes okay. it has. Okay, good. And then uh, we have time for one more question. Are you selling a product, a service, or both? 
Are so, you um, going to, are you going to be hiring the people and training them that actually put the I'm going to call it the MD did I get that right? Yeah. MD yeah. into the lake. So um, our main service, I mean, our main uh, thing that we're trying to do is a service. So we're going to be targeting things such as like government, since they own a lot of big bodies of water, or uh, private owners who we can um, go and uh, use our product on them. And then eventually, maybe, probably further than year three, but we do want to turn it maybe into a product. But the issue of a product is that the amount of product that we need is different per body of water. And yeah, you could tell. And uh, yes, we are going to train workers to uh, uh, be able to safely use the product and uh, be able to uh, distribute as necessary. Yeah, in the first couple of years, we'll be training and it will be a full service in the first couple of years. But later down the line, we'll be um, marketing more towards consumers and making it easier for them to use on their um, personal bodies of water too. Got it. All right, great. Thank you. Um, All right, so uh, now we'll be taking a quick break. Uh, so it's about 1130 right now. So we will be starting uh, with our next group, uh, which will be Liquitricity at 1140. So we will see you all back here, uh, ideally one to two minutes before 1140. Oh, are we muted? Wait. Yeah, we're muted. Hi, excuse me. Uh, we have two mentors that have been in the waiting room for a long time. Is it okay if you let them in? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. What did you say? We've had two mentors who have been in the waiting room for over an hour. Is it okay if you let them in? Oh, I think they're already in right now. Doran and oh. Yeah. Yeah, they've, they've, they've been in. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to do it over online. Very nice of you. We're very happy to be a part of the competition. Sorry, it's so it's so hard to hear you guys because there's the rumble of the auditorium. What did you say? Oh, I was just saying thank you so much for the opportunity to do it over online. We really oh, appreciate it. Of course. It. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad that you guys are still able to present thanks to the power of, of the internet and Zoom. So, um, so we'll see everyone back in, in a little bit.
when is the next? Oh, um. Right, so if uh, Liquitricity could come up, I think that's you guys. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there a couple of handheld mics for those that want them? Don't forget to speak into the mic. I'm just going to give you guys that reminder. Hey guys, could you turn on uh, Shant's yeah. Zoom meeting uh, mic and camera for me? Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we got it. Lincoln Middle School presents Liquitricity, a true savior. The inventors for this product are Jacob Gilstein, Elliot Hoppin Ortiz, Liam Sauer, Washington Chua, but it was all made possible by Miss O'Brien and our mentors. Who are we? Liquitricity is a helping can to impoverished neighborhoods who don't necessarily have access to water and electricity. What is Liquitricity? It's a nano water filtration system combined with a hydroelectric generator. It's about the size of a Coca-Cola bottle, making it transportable. Additionally, because of Liquitricity's affordability, underprivileged communities will be able to afford this product. Said before yeah, that. Sorry. Yeah. How efficient is Liquitricity? Liquitricity can consistently charge a phone, battery pack, and other survival gadgets. Additionally, according to one of the manufacturers we contacted, it can produce up to a whopping 80 volts. Liquitricity can filtrate dirty water containing bacteria, chlorine, nitrates, and other chemicals. Additionally, uh, the water filtration system does not waste any of that precious and beautiful water. So, how does li li Liquitricity work? In cases like our friend Robert, where both necessities of clean water and electricity are needed, liquidity fulfills the objective. The question is, how does liquidity mirac miraculously create a two-pronged solution to two of the biggest problems at the forefront of our society, a lack of clean water and a lack of electricity? In reality, liquidity is not ingenious because of the scientific process it uses, but because of the application of two very common STEM practices, hydroelectric generation and water filtration. So, as the water funnels down the filter, it goes towards a turbine. The rotation of this turbine ends up generating mechanical work, which through a system of pulleys and a DC motor generates electricity. The water then flows down towards the filtration system where it is purified. So this filtration system is where the nanoscience is applied. First off, there are two polypropylene sponges, one at the top and one at the bottom, and they each remove any contaminants coming in or out of the filter. Below that, there is a layer of copper zinc formulation. This copper zinc formulation removes heavy metals like lead or mercury through a system called kinetic degradation fluxion. This system redoxes or gives electrons to an element in order to make it less harmful. Below that is a polymeric membrane. This membrane separates um, bacteria and metalloids like arsenic from the water and lets the water pass through. Lastly, excluding the other polypropylene sponge, there is a layer of uh, GAC or granular activated carbon that through its pore surfaces absorbs uh, chemicals like chlorine and nitrates. All these steps combine together to create a clean, tasty, and healthy method for uh, generating water while also solving a crucial need for electricity. After the science, it's very important to keep in mind the cost comparison between Liquitricity and our top competitors. As you see over here, Liquitricity is the only company that produces electricity, unlike any other com uh, competitors, which is a very big deal. Additionally, we have an effective water filtrator like the rest, and our water filtration system lasts for about a uh, year, give or take. It also comes in one piece, which might seem like an insignificant detail at first, but the most major complaint in the water filtration system industry is that it doesn't come in one piece because people can easily lose pieces and so on. 
Also, we are transportable like all of our other top competitors. And lastly, what sets our product aside and is going to be the reason why we're going to dominate the transportable water filtration system industry is that we are multi-use. If you see price for product over here, our product price is quite mid-range compared to the other products. And we solve two solutions, while they only solve one. We know how important it is to advertise our product, especially compared to our competitors, which have been on the market for longer than us. Since our product is so new, Liquidricity considers meeting and partnering with other nonprofit organizations for more influence and advertisement. In addition to that, we understand how important it is to advertise our product to areas that don't have access to the internet. Since our target groups are impoverished areas, we know that only a limited amount of people in those areas actually have access to the internet. Therefore, Liquidricity will be gaining more outreach by traveling in person advertising our product. Our predictions for the next few years of Liquidricity are in the first year, we're going to be we're going to be spending almost one million dollars on personnel on the patent and expenses. In the second year, we're going to be spending almost two uh, oh, over one million dollars on uh, expenses and personnel. And then in the third year, we're going to be increasing. Oh wait, we're also going to be selling ten products uh, ten products uh, daily on the first year, second year twenty, and on the third year, we're going to be selling fifty which also we're going to be spending almost, uh, almost $2 million on, uh, on personnel and expenses. But on the four fourth year or more, we're going to be, mo we're going to be spending almo more than $2 million on expenses and personnel, which we're going to be starting to move into industrial scale, which will make us be able to do more than 100, uh, pro 100 products sold daily, uh, or even more if, if we break even. Uh, we want to say thank you to Mr. Brian for parents who brought us here to this moment and the judges who made this possible. <laughs> okay, so I'll start. Um, uh, the water filtration part was well described, but the energy generation was not so detailed described. So you mentioned a voltage that it could produce, but not a current. And the current times the voltage is the power. And my guess is the currents may not be very high. Yes, so it's gonna depend on how much water you actually end up putting into it. So if you have large amounts of water, like a, a few gallons, then it's gonna be more than if you put in a tiny amount of water. Um, this wa product would actually work best if you actually use more and more water. So the idea would be that you, you know, you come with a bowl and you drop it into the uh, filter and it would, you know, do the process. So it depends on how much water you're putting in. But, you know, we would want to have as much water as possible going into the machine. Um, additionally, we're going to have a funnel that has a very long tube of approximately four centimeters. So once you pour the water into the funnel, um, the water won't lose any velocity and the water would go through the turbine for an extended period of time rather than just pouring the whole bowl into the mini turbine when it's just going to be one burst of 80 volts. It's going to be a consistent charge of maybe a third of 80 volts. Let's say, and for reference, it takes approximately um, two to five volts to charge a phone. Right, but that's the voltage. But what the number yes. you guys need in order to do this is the the total energy density that you need to charge a phone. So the total power, and so it that the voltage is is not the full the full number. So I think you guys just need different metrics mm. to be able to say if you can do what you're you're trying to do. Got it, we'll look into it, but just so you know, we're actually, so we're basing this off of, uh, remember how I was saying, like we're using already, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that's already been done. Th we have already researched this, and this does actually work in practical applications, even in on small scales. So it's not like we're going in this with like something that we've just completely invented. We're basing this off of uh, past experiments. So I might have been looking down at this <laughs> at this particular moment, but uh, when you when you talk about the turbine, and and how you generate the energy to work the turbine, are you are you taking it back and plugging it in? How does it work outside when you're? So yeah, so the turbine the is basically the water. It's also it's more of a water wheel than it is a turbine. It's kind of the same thing, but the water basically go goes down and it's going to push the turbine. The turbine is going to spin, and there's pulleys attached to the turbine. So as the turbine spins those pulleys are going to actually turn an uh, end of a DC motor, and that's going to generate an electric voltage. And there's going to be an output to that turbine as well. Yeah. 
So in your milestones, you mentioned, uh, you know, your 110 product, your 220 product, and so forth. Are you talking about different varieties of the product or unit sold? Uh, that we're, uh, we're talking about how much, how many products are we aiming to sell day, uh, every day? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, basically, uh, liquid is like, it's one, uh, like the size of your water bottle. You're, you're selling, uh, we're wanting to sell in the first year, like 10 of those every day, okay. which, which sums up like to a thousand a, a year. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, so, quick question is uh, on the cost side. Your your selling price is eighteen ninety nine, I think, yes, on one sure. of the sides. Mm -hmm. What's what's your what's the cost of actually? Uh, the cost of creating the uh, of creating the thing is seven dollars and forty two cents. That's the total bomb cost. Yes, and we have already manufacturers lined up and already selling the products, and that's including shipping. And also, we also have shipping, including to the port of of, of all the products being uh, uh, imported to the port of Long Beach. Yes. And you're going to sell it direct to consumers, or are you selling through Targets and Walmarts of the world? Um, we're going to be selling it, I believe, um, selling it directly to consumers, and we're also we're going to do be we're going to be doing a little bit of both in a sense. We're going to try to get a large outreach and expand over g globally. And it turns out there's a lot of places that don't necessarily have access to water and electricity, so it's a really big market out there that can be fulfilled. And currently, the transportable water filtration industry is 47 billion dollars, approximately there. And so this this uh, our product being multi-use can really push up up uh, push up push us up the ranks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Fully Grow is our next group. My name is Emily. I'm Madeline. I'm Angelina. I'm Kathy. And I'm Sophie. Oh, and we're Folly Grow. Our proposal, Follow Gel, by us, Follow Girls, utilizes nano based technology to combat common occurrences of androgenetic hair loss. Androgenetic alopecia, or hair loss, is an unfortunately prevailing disorder for about 50 million men and 30 million women suffering from it in the US alone, and globally, 147 million people. Due to medical conditions, some of us have personally been through negative hair experiences, acting as one of the motivating factors of our company. Most solutions such as wigs and laser light therapy tend to be costly and the majority of them are not covered by insurance, leaving a burden on the person buying it. Comparatively, Follow Girls product is cheaper and more convenient for the general public compared to the aforementioned treatments. Follow Girl utilizes hair follicle enlarging ingredients within a gel-like consistency to minimize adverse effects like the prominent concern of irritation. Our nano encapsulation allows an extended shelf life as well as a controlled release system for better retention of our ingredients. Therefore, our results will be seen in less than four months. The nanoparticles we use in our product are seen here, but namely nano minoxidil work together to promote hair regrowth and to prevent further damage. Pumpkin seed oil in specifically blocks DHT, and sandwich sorbyl efficientalis root extract blocks FGF5. Both DHT and FGF5 contribute to inhibiting the hair growth cycle, therefore we are tackling the problem at the very roots. Adding on, an advantage we have in the hair loss industry includes our use of nano-based technology, including nanoparticles, encapsulation, and emulsions. The size of the nanoparticles allows us to efficiently deliver the compound directly to the hair bulb. Meanwhile, the encapsulation encloses the substances, as mentioned previously, to enhance retention through a slow and controlled release. And the emulsions allow us to successfully incorporate both the oil and water-based ingredients in our product. As you can see, this is our process for making nanominoxidil from conventional minoxidil and the nanoemulsion via the ultrasonic heater. Over here, we can see how the nanominoxidil and the sericin nanoparticles can only infiltrate through the hair follicle gap. However, the nano emulsions of the oils can penetrate and enter the bloodstream where they can deliver nutrients as well as block up the compounds that inhibit growth. 
Our market analysis shows that in 2021 in the U.S., the hair loss treatment market is valued at $23.5 billion, in which the demand for our product is growing in increasingly fast-growing markets such as in the U.S., India, and China. Alone in the U.S., uh, 12.47 million Americans use hair loss treatment products each year. With this number, we are projected to make $3.6 million in profit in the second year when we launch. Looking forward towards our third year in the future, we're projected to make 278% more than we did in the previous year, which is $556,000 sales, generating eight figures of $10.1 million. Our cost analysis breakdown is quite simple, where our raw ingredients and other cost uh, components add up to $45.44 to produce our product. Our profit margin is 40.82%, which is $18.55 per bottle sold. And we are selling our bottle at the price of $63.99. So looking into our competitive analysis, we've listed the key benefits, price per month, and usage for results from our company alongside two of our top competitors. When looking at Folly Grow's biggest benefit is the use of nano minoxidil, which doesn't have the adverse side effects of conventional minoxidil, which is irritation and inflammation according to customer reviews. Looking to usage for results, you can see that Folly Grow uh, is more convenient for consumers as it's only one application per day for 30 minutes, whereas our competitors, Rogaine's and Hims, is two applications per day, and each application is four hours long, leading to eight hours of dedication per day from consumers. In our milestones, the first year will be dedicated towards research, research and development of our product to be able to mass distribute. This will lead to our soft launch in the same year to uh, build our brand name. For, and this is to help with our second year launch of Folly Gel, which is our hero product. And then after this, we're going to start building connections with cancer treatment centers to be able to provide more research, uh, uh, to provide more resources for those who are losing hair due to chemotherapy. In the third year, we're going to launch this line, and because of our two lines of products, we're going to trademark our brand alongside Expand Internationally. Our mission is to improve the lives of AJA patients by providing an affordable and effective product. Our company plans to be seen as the world's leading brand for hair loss with an, with an innovative and effectual product compared to current solutions which have recurring responses of irritation and inflammation. By integrating beneficial components of hair loss products, Follicle strives to provide an inclusive product for anyone suffering hair loss. Please refer to our social media and thank you for listening to our pitch. We hope to see your hair fully grow. <laughs> why, why do we have a trend here? Okay. Um, I, I, I will just start. Um, so you're using an established chemical that is the same basic compound as in the, the Rogaine, or whatever it is, and then you're going to make a nano emulsion out of this. So I mean, the real question is, does it work? I mean, if it works, you'll make, you will make any amount of money, because I think that if people's hair is falling out, they will pay almost any quantity to save that. And yeah. so what it comes down to is, what evidence do you have that taking this same, this it's as far as I understand, it's the same compound that's used, but you're making a nano emulsion out of it. And so what is your evidence that that will be better than the current version? So in our research, there have been actual research articles pu published by the government which shows its credibility, and it mainly focused on nano minoxidil, which when tested on mice, it actually promoted hair regrowth and actually showed more effi more effective results than regular minoxidil. And like you said, this is exactly how minoxidil works. However, minoxidil is too big to penetrate into the hair follicle gaps, so it finds other ways to penetrate, like going into the skin, causing a lot of irritation. So by making it nano-sized, you're able to um, take the same components, but it's going to go into the hair follicle gaps, which just increases the efficiency of it. But it's probably also going to go into the skin, but maybe you could use less. So. Um, the up so then I, I will pass on the mic, but the other question is if there is um, studies that show that this works better, does that mean somebody else owns the patent? Um, so for the process of nano minoxidil, there was one where it's the milling process and it has been um, patented, but the process for nano minoxidil itself has not been patented. Okay. 
So it looks like you're providing a, a, a stronger uh, and better working uh, substance, right? That's going to cost less because they're applying it one time a day versus multiple times, 30 minutes only versus many hours. So from a safety perspective, uh, have you looked into what would happen if, let's say, someone left it on too long or someone was very excited and eager and applied it four times one day? <laughs> um, to answer that question, it's um, not as beneficial for the consumers to do this. And this is mainly because this takes up a lot of time in their day, especially when looking at Rogaine and Hims, in terms of how many times or how many hours they have to spend just putting on this product. You wanna put on this product knowing that even in a shorter amount of time, you can still grow back the same amount of hair and the same amount of efficiency. So consumers are most likely not to leave this on their hair, but even if they do, it's not gonna lead to any adverse side effects. Thank you. I think on one of your slides, um, you said that you want to kind of build a brand, right? Um, kind of what, what, what's the thought process of being able to kind of build that brand? Um, so in order to build our um, uh, thought process, the thought process to in order to building our brand name would probably be that our hero product with Folly Gel is our open to the target audience. And this would build a brand name of helping hair regrowth on everybody. And further into the second year, when we connect with um, cancer um, treatment centers, is when we target our um, second line where we produce a product that um, also helps and support chemo patients. So then this would also um, build our brand name of helping, like also similar to Rogaine, where we um, would be um, growing hair, uh, no, regrowth hair efficiently and effectively. Uh, part of building a brand is getting awareness, mm -hmm. right? How do you how do you intend to go about building awareness of your uh, of kind of what you guys are doing? Um, so um, in the first year, when we are um, also in our research and development stage for commercialization and mass um, distribution, we also plan to also have a soft launch, and with that, we plan to go out to conventions such as um, the health medical con convention, where it there it was. Um, a lot of other medical products as well um, go out there for networking and communication to um, get their brand out there and while they present their exhibit and their product to consumers and other um, medical um, competitors in their industry. So something to think about when you listed all your competitors like Rogaine, they spend a ton of money on advertisement, right? Including television, it's probably how you know them, right? Something to think about here is I don't see anywhere in your cost, right? Or at least meaningful cost that are in the advertising and marketing and how to generate kind of awareness aspect of it. Your soft launch is 35,000. That's probably literally one convention, right? And, and to build a brand name could be very challenging in one convention in um, a given year. Yeah, so in terms of the cost for marketing, it's also included in the price for the launch line for CTC as well in the launch line of Folly Gel. And so that's why the cost is are um, 250K into 400K for both years. You just want, uh, I would just look at what the costs are for consumer product good launches, and it's gonna be likely very significant. It's probably the largest cost that you will have, not your build of material costs. That's usually tenants mm -hmm. relative to brand building costs. So just something to keep in mind. Thank you. All right, so our next group is <laughs> once again, ooh, <laughs> sample bottles. <laughs> All right, so our next group is uh, our other, our other online group. Uh, yeah, so our next group is Demeter. So hello, Demeter. Let me get you on hello. the screen. And spotlight you. Um, and you guys should oh be able God. to share your screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. You are. You're on mute. Okay. Yeah, you're on mute. Should be loading. It's loading. Oh. Uh, so it's your presentation's still loading, so let's yeah. give it a minute. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, judges, you guys are ready? 
Okay, uh, so Demeter, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Before we get started today, I just want to take five seconds out of your time to ask you a very simple question. What is the language that everybody knows? If you need a hint, it's here on the slide. <laughs> if you guess food, then you guess correctly. Food is everywhere and is most often a person's uh, way to express themselves. It's in every celebration, every culture, and it's a part of a person's everyday life. And despite it being the 21st century, there's no form of technology that gives a person the ability to know what is in the food they eat. And that's what we're here to address. This is Francine, Marianne, Angela, Namcha, and, and this, this is, is Demeter. Demeter. There is a wide range of people who want to know the nutritional content of the food they eat, whether it be athletes, serious dieters, diabetics, or just everyday people. Nutritional knowledge branches out into multiple monetizable markets, with one being the weight management market currently valued at $32.7 billion, a phenomenal number for us to tap into. The meter's main task lies in its ability to calculate the carbs, proteins, calories, and fats in any given meal. Each one of these macronutrients is able to serve its own purpose and target a different demographic that overall contributes to the health of modern society. This is done in the form of a multi-chamber pen that miniaturizes current laboratory techniques for analytic determination. Demeter prioritizes ease of use on the consumer's side, making the outside of the device mimic a pen that is extremely portable and lightweight. The person simply takes the cap, fills it up with components of their dish, to which it is then blended up and undergoes its designated processes. We have chosen the phenyl sulfuric acid method for carbohydrates. Sulfuric acid breaks down the sugars in the sample, phenyl dyeing them, and then a spectrophotometer measures this color change via measuring absorbance values. We have chosen a very similar method called the Bradford method for proteins, but instead of using phenol and sulfuric acid, we are utilizing a Bradford reagent. For lipids, we are utilizing a paper microfluidic chip. This paper is coated in different chemicals, including gold nanoparticles, that when interacting with the sample, initiate a color changing reaction. The intensity of this color changing reaction will be detected by a camera that utilizes AI software. All of these techniques do not require an excessive quantity of materials, extreme conditions, are portable, cheap, and have an accuracy rating that never bypasses zero to two percent. Not only that, but they have a lot of similarities, allowing for a lot of overlap and instrumentation when it comes time for miniaturization. This information will, will be binded to an app in which the user can view data, cast data, and receive recommendations or notifications if something is dangerously low or high. Cartridges can be purchased via a subscription plan in order for the user to replace the bottom of the pen, which contains all the needed solvents. Now, you might be wondering why a device like this is relevant to you. For one, no other product exists like it. And yet the science that is being utilized is not necessarily new, just miniaturized, making it a fantastic product to invest in due to the high probability of it succeeding. Not only that, but the techniques we've chosen produce a mass amount of information within 10 to 15 minute span. Today's current options require a person to navigate through this information themselves, are almost never accurate, nor are they applicable to homemade foods of different backgrounds. That's what's so special about Demeter. It can be utilized for a variety of different foods, whether it be homemade, restaurant, or prepackaged food. The uniqueness of the meter is why we are investing in both domestic and international patents to secure our science for ourselves. So these pens will be charged at $150 with a 150% markup. Our subscription plan is our main source of income, which will have a 216% markup. Demeter also plans to partner with pharmaceutical companies, doctor's offices, and even personal trainers to prescribe Demeter to patients or clients. With this in mind, we have an asking price of 1.2 million USD for the first year alone. While we plan to gain the majority of our funding from venture capital firms, the capabilities of Demeter extends itself into a variety of health associated funds and grants that may be willing to partner and invest into the product. We are going to utilize this 1.2 million to establish a workable prototype by the end of our first year, making year two our alpha and beta test period and year three our full consumer product launch. And with that, Knowledge, Knowledge is power, know what you eat. And that's it. We'd like to say a quick thank you to our mentors, Natalie, Doran, Lisa, Michelle, and James, to our, to our coach, Dusty, and to Benjamin Sun for 3D modeling our cosmetic prototype and the whole Nanovation team for giving us the opportunity to present this today. We really, really, really wish we were there, but regardless, we are extremely confident with our product and its capabilities and are sure of the impact and power of our device. 
is illustrated through our presentation. We yield the rest of our time to questions. Yay! All right, thank you. So our judges are uh, walking up right now, so we'll just uh, give them a minute. Getting old. Um, no, it's working. Uh, so you're using established methods, um, and that does really add a lot to your feasibility. So my question is, what are the key technical challenges in miniaturizing this, and how long are the reagents that you need to use stable? So what kind of shelf life can this product have and give you accurate results? So. A lot of the biggest issue we honestly had was just the sheer size and conditions that would come with a lot of the techniques. For example, with proteins, one of the big issues we came into contact with was, was the fact that in order to like speed up a process, you have to heat it. And like the heating goes up to like a thousand degrees Celsius. And we're not going to put something that's a thousand degrees Celsius inside of our pen. We were searching for methods that one had a lot of overlap and two didn't have that many materials. Cause like another method that we were looking at utilized gas chromatography. Another method utilized like paper chromatography. These methods are huge laboratory machines. And that's why we went to colorimetric methods or methods that you just utilize light in order to make sure that we don't have to utilize any of these things. When it comes to shelf life, the majority of our solvents do last pretty long, but in the case that let's say um, after like a few, after let's say like six months, the shelf life runs out, part of our subscription plan is resupplying refills and these refills will be able to substitute that in the case that they do run out and they will be fresh off and they get 10 cartridges every month, which is the equivalent of 60 uses. So that would fulfill that in case that let's say after six months, the shelf life does run out. I eat in restaurants a lot. How would you use this in a restaurant? So, okay, here's our pen. Let's say you have your meal in front of you. Let's say it's something like fettuccine alfredo. The size of the cap is exactly one tablespoon, which is 15 grams, which is the amount we need for all of the techniques. You would just take a bit of your fettuccine alfredo, put it in here, close it, and then we're gonna have an app attached to the device that essentially you can press when you want it to start. Once it starts, it does the techniques. It only takes around 10 to 15 minutes. That's honestly the hardest part is the patience that comes with that. But once that's over, you have to input on a menu. They usually give you the total number of calories. You input the total number of calories that is on the menu. And then it tells you all of the rest of the information based off the things that's done in this device. And then you can use it six times before you have to take off the cartridge and then replace it. And that's pretty much the process. Like we're very focused on making sure the person doesn't have to do anything. The information is just given to them straight away. Yeah. So just a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Don't you think there will be a social stigma with testing your food in a restaurant? Well, that's the thing about the design of the meter is not something that's like really clunky or hard to carry around because we kind of designed it that way. So it could be used in a variety of environments, whether it's at home or in a restaurant. And because of this kind of like sleek kind of subtle design, there isn't as much of a stigma because you're kind of just taking out a simple device and testing out your food. And it makes it more subtle and easier and more just convenient for the consumer overall. Uh, how, how much is that refill um, that, that uh, after you use it six times, right? Whatever the case may be, how much is the, how much is the resupply? So basically it, it kind of works like a cartridge. You can pop it out and inside of the cartridge, it works for like six times. And then afterwards, what we have is a subscription plan. And every month we would send you 10 new cartridges, assuming you subscribe. And every time after six uh, uses, the app would tell you, okay, you need to refill it. So you just pop it off, click a new one in. That's all you have to do. How, how much does it cost? How, how much does that cost for that new cartridge? Oh. Okay, so if you go to our cost thing, one of the things that we were really about is that the majority of our profit is gonna come from our subscription plan. It costs quite a lot to actually manufacture the pen considering we're miniaturizing things that are already expensive. So honestly, we could technically sell it at a loss, but our subscription plan, it only takes, I believe, $45 to make a cartridge. And then that also comes with the app, which is like a one to $2 for the maintenance of that app, which 
we've decided to make it a 216% markup, which is $12.99 a month or yearly for $150. And that is equivalent of 60 uses a month for 12 months or 10 cartridges that we would just send you. And what's your go-to-market strategy? Direct-to-consumer? And that's it. Yeah. Uh, what's your go-to-market strategy? Is that direct-to-consumer or going there, through like a Walmart target? Initially, we're just going to sell it off our website. But one of our main goals for year to five is basically doing a massive social media campaign and then also finding endorsements. Because something that Demeter can technically do is we're hoping that one day we can allow it to link up to glucometers and link up to the number of steps a person is walking based off the phone data and link up to the amount of sugar they're intaking. And this could very much become a tool for diabetics. One of the things we're definitely looking into is potentially getting it FDA approved and doing clinical trials and partnering companies and doctors that could prescribe this for their diabetic patients. And we're also just planning on making it so that one day it's so accessible, you could go to like a CVS, just buy it off the market, especially if you're someone who's like a gym junkie who wants to like prioritize their health, you know? <laughs> All right, well done. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Go yeah, to meet thank you. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> So our next group is uh, Plastigo. Hello, my name is Neo Gamba. I am Nikita Ramrod. And I am Dianj Koyo. And we would also like to give our regards from our very vital team member, Karthik Chandramali, who is unfortunately not be able to present, come here today. We are from Hyde Middle School in Cupertino. And we are, we are here to present our company, Plastigo. We have designed a microbial thermoelectric fuel cell, or MTC, that breaks down polyethylene, terephthalic, or PET plastic which is typically used in water bottles and is one of the most, is one of the most common plastics, uh, is one of the most common plastics. We will also harvest the energy from the heat produced from the reaction that breaks down the PET and from the reaction itself. We plan to sell our MTC to Material Recovery Facilities or MRF. MRF specialize in processing recyclables to produce new materials that will generate revenue. Our product will dispose of PET plastic and produce electricity which can be sold to the grid. We are addressing the problem of current plastic waste. About 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic are being dumped into the environment around the world each year. This is severely impacting our environment and wildlife. Currently, the main method of disposing plastic is landfills. Disposing of plastic through landfills is unfavorable because plastic sitting in landfills releases gases harmful for our environment along with open dumps, which take up 69% of the pipe bed. Incineration is also used less than landfills and open dumps, but more than other, more, for more frequently than other more favorable methods, coming up to 11%. Burning plastic produces toxic gases, which again has a negative impact on our environment and human health, leading to issues such as damaged kidneys, liver, and nervous system. Recycling me favorable methods like recycling are not used as often because recycling is more expensive than buying plastic from raw materials. Here is the design of our microbial thermoelectric fuel cell. It includes stainless steel casing, a mineral insulator, a platinum a nanostructured anode, an indium tin oxide cathode, and bismuth telluride nanowires. This is the science behind our design. Our company cultures the bacteria Idianella psychiensis to produce the enzyme petase, which we then combine with MHEPase to create a super enzyme that breaks down PET plastic. The MTC uses both components of a microbial fuel cell and a thermoelectric energy generator. The microbial fuel cell component is with the nanostructured platinum anode, which captures electrons released as the breakdown of PET plastic into MHEP and CHEP occurs. It is nano-sized, so it has the most surface area and comes into contact with most of the enzymes. The electrons are transferred to an energy collector and sent to the grid, 
This book has been completed through an indium tin oxide cathode. Our, com our MPC also uses components of thermoelectric through the feedback effect to convert the differences in te temperature between inside and outside in the MPC into energy. We have bismuth telluride nanowires encasing and going through the stainless steel to make contact with both sides of the MPC and it's nano size, so it has the most surface area to volume ratio, so it is cheaper to use it in large amounts, and it can convert the most differences in temperature. The energy is then sent to the grid. During the first seven years, during the first seven years, we have some key milestones we plan to hit. So for the first two years, we plan to conduct research and development for our product and uh, perform an in-depth market study. On year three, we plan to release it to the market. Years four through five, we are going to conduct some product improvement and business management. Year six, we are going to start leasing to international markets. And on year seven, we're going to start exploring some possible market expansions, such as um, the different types of, for different types of plastic and composting. Next, we're going to go into the cost benefit analysis for one MTC. It goes... So the raw material cost for comes for around nine million seven hundred thousand dollars, and the assembly costs are for are around eight hundred fifty dollars. The cost for one MTC on the market is around eleven million six hundred thousand dollars, and five hundred fifty watts are produced every twenty four hours, or or three thousand three hundred dollars, which can be sold to the grid. We are um, we guarantee that our MTC. We'll, um, yeah, sorry. We're, we guarantee that the MTC will have a great impact on the, on the environment and the, um, and the PET market, which can, w um, and the PET market. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah, I'll just make them feel bad. Okay. So, um, all of the pieces of the technology that you have presented are are real and feasible. So, the problem with energy is everything costs energy. And so, my question is: Have you looked at the energy balance? That is to say, if you take the total amount of energy that you can generate and the total amount of energy that it costs to make all of this, are you really coming out net energy positive? And I just, you know, the, the base comment is thermoelectrics, like the bismuth systems that you're integrating here, have existed for a long time, but nobody's using them because the energy, ba or rarely are using them. Because in other c situations, the energy balance, it's just too much cheaper to use fossil fuels and stuff for your energy, and that's where that's where we're sort of stuck on renewables. So have you looked at that energy balance and do you win? So yeah, it does produce most en I mean more energy than it takes to um, use it. And then um, yeah, a lot of energy is sent to the grid, which provides money for the company to expand it more and produce even more energy. And we're going to put it all over America and to places like Japan and China and um, yeah, that's how we're going to make money off of it and get as much energy as possible. Um, so there's certainly a scale. Yeah. Um, but is the, is the fabrication cost? How, maybe a different question. How long will it take your energy production from this device to balance the energy cost to make it? So... Um, the goal of our product um, is not really to make more energy than it, it needs to power it. It's mainly to get rid of is to dispose of plastic in a more efficient way because there are not many efficient ways. Most are sitting in landfills, which is taking up a valuable land space and doing negative harm toward the environment. Okay, you you can you you can be less good on energy in that situation. Yeah, so the energy is just a nice bonus.
uh, who, who are your who are your expected customers that you're going to be marketing this to? Um, the MRF, the MRFs. So MRFs, they um, take waste and they tr try to make a profit out of it, or or just basically so they get rid of it and try to make something useful out of it. So what we're going to do? So we sell. We're going to sell it to them. They're going to break down the plastic and get electricity out of it. And they can also harvest the byproducts. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so when you're selling to the MRFs, right? Yeah. Obviously, they are, a lot of these MRFs are actually for profit yeah. businesses, right? Yeah. We're so going to uh, receive the PET plastic from the MRFs to put inside our MTCs. Right. And so, y uh, y the, but the MRFs are, are buying the system from you, right? Yeah. And it's costing them what, what something around eleven. $11 yeah, eleven million. million. Right. So they're, they they want to make a return on that, right? Because they are for profit businesses, right? So how how do they make the return, and how long does it take for them to make a return on this investment? Okay, so on the electricity loan, it'll take around nine years, which is a lot. But there's also byproducts which are produced, which like um. Did you say the byproducts? Oh yeah, like um. When a uh, PET plastic breaks down, it, um, it converts into MHE-10-BECT, which we can then sell to some companies to make use of that. Okay, so you're thinking the total return period is less than nine years? Yes. Any idea of kind of when that's gonna, wh when the return profile is gonna hit neutral? Um, not yet, that's what we're gonna do in the first two years. We plan to take use that period to do more in-depth market study and product development for that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. Last and certainly not least, we've got Viking Chill. Real quick, before we start our presentation, I just want to say it's an honor to present in front of everyone here, especially you guys up front. Thank you for your time. And we want to thank all our mentors, our teachers, and everyone who helped support us. And if we're a little frazzled, frazzled we apologize because we graduated last night. So. <laughs> okay. so, here goes nothing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ainsley. I'm Arjun. I'm Ryan. And I'm Aditya. And we're Viking Chill, the modern solution to technology's heating problem. So what exactly is the problem? As you're aware, computers these day and age are always advancing in order to keep up with the growing information we need them to process. However, as computers and electronics in general become more and more advanced, they need to consume more energy, producing more heat, and therefore becoming more prone to overheating. For a computer to operate effective, efficiently and effectively, it's imperative that electronics are kept cool. In fact, some data centers have moved their entire servers to colder countries such as Iceland just to keep their servers cold. Viking Chill aims to create a coolant that will not only allow computers to be kept at the ideal temperature, but eventually many other electronics too, most notably electric car batteries. All right, so now let's talk about the solution and some of the science behind it. So building off some of the latest research in nanoparticles, our solution is a 40 nanometer zinc oxide solution suspended in ethylene glycol and water. And essentially we do this to increase thermal conductivity. It's really simple. All an end user has to do is just pour this liquid into their pre-existing liquid cooling loop in their computer and boom, lower temperatures. So let's explain some of our choices then in our um, selection of materials. So why zinc oxide nanoparticles? Well, we chose zinc oxide nanoparticles because they have a high thermal conductivity, higher than water. They're antimicrobial, so you can clean your water cooling loops less as opposed to like distilled water. And they're safe for human contact. I mean, zinc oxide is used in like sunscreens and stuff. So if the end user spills a little bit on themselves, it won't be harmful to them. Furthermore, it's cheap, which is obviously always important. Um, and why ethylene glycol? It increases the temperature range, which are fluid functions. And that way we can use it in more systems. Now let's talk a little about the science. The science is relatively simple, and that's the beauty of this product. So essentially, the zinc and nanoparticles increase the average rate of heat transfer, which allows um, improved efficiency and speed for the heat transfers, which means more thermal energy gets siphoned out of your components faster, and that's how we're getting the lower temperatures. And so, I'm sorry, 
Um, now let's talk about how we'll freeze the competition. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, an apt example for the state of the arc is EKWB's uh, cryophil PC coolant, a mixture of distilled water uh, dyes and anti-corrosive and antibacterial additives. These additives decrease the operating temperature at which the fluid can function, which limits their use in hotter temperatures and high wattage components. The dyes they use also results in long-term clumping, which decreases the longevity of their products. A competitor similar to us in technology will be GoChiller and their graphene nanoparticle coolant suspended in a water glycol fluid. Their coolant uh, provides a worse thermal energy to, uh, sorry, thermal conductivity to Viking Chill, a much higher electrical conductivity, which is actually very dangerous for electronics as spilling the fluid would cause, uh, potentially cause electrical shorts and damage your electronics. Uh, next slide. So for our market analysis, um, for our first couple years of development, we'll be targeting both <coughs> computer enthusiasts and enterprise computing. Since the pandemic, an increasing number of people have been seeking high watch systems for both gaming and cloud computing. These markets are growing immensely as technology seeps more and more into our daily lives. Eventually, we hope to expand into other industries such as battery cooling for automotive industries. Uh, we plan to reach the environmentally minded market of electric car users by advertising the sustainability of our product. So now let's move on to the business side. So this is our unit cost breakdown. Based off of quotes for our uh, unit costs and uh, analysis of our competitors' pricing, we've determined that our pricing will be $24.99 per uh, unit, which is one liter. Uh, that gives us a profit margin of 74.8%. Uh, this is our expected financial breakdown for the first three years. Uh, our expected first year cost is $437,000, and the majority of our money will be going to raw materials, employee compensation, and payroll services. Uh, we expect to sell 20,000 units in our first year, giving us a gross revenue of $373,000, and with 15% growth per year, we should reach profitability by year three. In our first year, we'll be finalizing our product and beginning to advertise using targeted ads on various social media platforms, and we will be reaching out to our market audience by giving uh, small batches of our products to various influencers and leveraging that to sell our products directly to consumers. Uh, and we will be scaling up our production as demand increases. During year two, we will begin approaching profitability, which we plan to reach by year three, allowing us to expand into international markets and improve our manufacturing process. Uh, by, year, uh, by year four, we will start uh, marketing to the enterprise system space. And in year five, we will enter the growing automobile cooling industry. Um. Something that's imperative to the Viking ch to Viking Chill is our sustainability and impact on the environment. Our product in general is centered around the idea of reducing energy and carbon emissions. As such, we pr plan to start a recycling program, and um, and once we enter the market of electric car batteries, uh, we'll be able to reduce battery waste. The beauty of Viking Chill lies in the fact that it's extremely simple and has the potential to grow into a huge market share. Thank you for li so much for listening to our presentation. Thank you. Okay. Her. Okay. So the first, the, the my key question is, so zinc oxide by itself has a high thermal conductivity. Yes. Little nanoparticles suspended in solution are not touching each other except when they collide. Yes. So, what what is your scientific evidence that a colloidal suspension of zinc oxide nanoparticles in uh, solution is really a better thermal conductor? All right. So. We did a multitude of research into research reports. Uh, particularly, there was one in China that was done recently where a helical heat transfer um, system, like a copper pipe in a helical shape, um, the 0.5% by volume zinc oxide suspension in ethylene glycol and water, like the exact same thing that we're doing, was actually um, passed through this helical heat exchanger and they recorded temperature decreases of anywhere from 78% to 136%, like better than just water. And the, the reason for that range is because it really does depend on the operating system, oper operating temperature of the system. The different temperatures will lead to different efficiencies. So does that again mean somebody else owns the patent for this? No, actually, um, we, we did a Google search on patents, um, on Google Scholar um, and other patent searches. Um, people own the patents to actually carbon nanotube cooling fluids, but not zinc oxide cooling fluids. So we would be okay with the patents. Okay, I'm going to pass this on, but just one quick comment. You mentioned in another device that they had dyes that make the things coagulate. 
the dyes are probably to make sure nobody drinks them. And so um, you may have to actually think about that even if they have negative effects. You have um. to make them look yucky. Yeah. The um. thing about the dyes is that they're mostly used for like a customization and like coloring purposes for like people like, oh, I just want this to be green. People like something. making it look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I saw in, the, in your pie chart, I yeah. think it was 17% for advertising. Who, who are you, who's your market um, for advertising? Arjun, would you like is to? It individuals or corporations? Or? Yeah, so initially we'll start marketing to enthusiast uh, computer owners. So like there's a large market of like, especially like uh, people who play video games that need fast computers and like uh, workstations uh, for people who need like large uh, uh, CAD files or things like that. that need like fast computing systems at home. And a lot of those people already are using liquid cooling systems. And then later on, uh, as you saw in our timeline, we'll be expanding into like enterprise systems and like data centers and the like. Uh, I'm just gonna add one thing. Um, I, I just wanna add, uh, one of our main marketing systems is by actually sending our product to influencers to review. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this room know who Linus Tech Tips is. Um, they actually did the review of the graphene coolant. So what, they, what, what we can do is we can send our product to them. They will review it and conduct a YouTube video on us in exchange for some sponsorship for some money to them. And they will post our link to our um, Amazon portal for, to purchase this product in their description. And that's how we will funnel people into our content. I may make myself look really stupid with this question, but right now I have three computers. I have a work laptop, I have a personal laptop, I have a desktop at work. I've never replaced the coolant on them. <laughs> Can you please explain to me, A, am I missing something, or B, are you gonna give this to an end user, expect them to open up a computer and replace some sort of coolant within the system? Anyone else? Okay. I've spoken a lot. Um, <laughs> to be completely clear, our market isn't like all uh, computing, like people who use some sort of computing. Like we're not, focusing on laptops, we're focusing on people who use like very high-end like systems in terms of computing, like those that reach the watts in the terms of the thousands. Um, basically like, you know, gaming, uh, data centers, people have to work with large CAD files. Okay. Um, I, I just yeah. wanna add. Like, Never yeah. mind. No. There's, <laughs> there's two main types of ways that like computers are cooled, is air cooling and liquid cooling. Yeah. So most uh, things are cooled by air. Yeah. So, but especially high performance systems, be because of like uh, fluids, like higher thermal conductivity and like higher efficiency, they're cooled using liquids. So don't worry, you're not hurting your computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so it means server environments. Is that what we're talking it's, about? It's like it's alienware. Alien uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like these people will go to such lengths that they will cut their own tubes, shape yeah. them and run fluid over their own CPUs. So they know what they're doing, but they just really chase like the, the lower temperatures. I learned something new. <laughs> You're welcome. So going back to your uh, your cost slide, yeah, um, your, your 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 compensation, uh, your payroll compensation piece feels a bit light. Uh, if your total cost is four hundred thirty-seven thousand, I will actually answer that real quick if that's okay. Sure. Um, the reason it's light is because we four are some of the main employees, and um, we figured that if we are starting the company, we will participate in the company for uh, most of the main like tasks. The only tasks that we felt that we couldn't participate as heavily in are obviously the science tasks, like the and so we're going to be hiring the scientists and one adver two t two scientists and one advertising personnel, and we'll handle the rest. Uh, that is still pretty light. If you, if you if I, if assuming total compensation and payroll services combined together, right, is tw less than thirty percent. Actually, so our first year is one scientist, and then we continue oh. to grow the scientists as we continue to grow towards. So you're not department. paying yourself. Yeah, so we're not getting yeah. paid because no. we're it's, a, it's the IT startup living in one house <laughs> <Yeah. life. laughs> Got, got it. A, a, and so your go-to-market strategy here, right? Um, you're focused on the, the, the gaming side, yeah. right? Uh, and I see like on, on the marketing side, 17% uh, of ca call it that yeah. is a bit light, mm -hmm. so right? We, I, I actually, sorry, not to interrupt, but I, was, I felt the same way when we started um, advertising, when we started doing research for advertising, but looking into how much it costs to advertise on YouTube and Twitch, we actually felt that this was a reasonable number um, because, adver uh, because targeted advertising on YouTube is so cheap nowadays because, um, because it's not as like, 
um, mainstream as like TV advertising, but we felt that this was more accurate to the type of consumers that we wanted to get. Yeah, it's cheaper because of the types of advertising. Yeah, right? just making sure mm -hmm. you this all tie back to conversion rates on mm -hmm. your on your advertisement. So you actually have to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's not exactly always going to be apples to apples. Yeah. So just keep in mind that's a that's a big part of it. Okay, thank we'll you. Do. Thank you. And well done, everyone. Those were all some really excellent presentations, for sure. Uh, so uh, we're gonna take uh, we're gonna take a break. So uh, we're gonna all go and grab some lunch, uh, and then the judges are gonna be convening to chat about all of your presentations and come to some conclusions. And we'll be meeting back here at uh, 1.40. Uh, so just a quick note, so everyone will go up to the sixth floor on the north side. You can try to take the stairs or you can take the elevator. The only request uh, I ask is that you uh, please let the judges grab their lunches first because we want to make sure they have ample time to discuss all of your wonderful presentations. Um, and so with that, uh, presenters, thank you all so much. And guests, thank you all so much for being here. And we'll be back again here at 1.40.
Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, uh, do we have everyone back? Are there still people in the lobby? Oh, uh, oh, is our, our, our Zoom friend still here? Did they leave? Maybe, yeah, maybe it timed out. Here, I'll start it again. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Whoa, okay, awesome. Uh, so, uh, we're about to start, do we have, so it does look like we have everyone here. Okay, perfect. All right, so, uh, First of all, before we announce the awards, I once again just have to stress the point um, that you guys all did a really, really excellent job and it is a tough competition to judge every year. I think it was honestly even harder to judge this year because you guys all did such, such good jobs presenting your projects. Everyone was so professional. Everyone was so prepared. You guys did a fantastic job. So please give yourselves all a round of applause. Every team should be really, really proud of what they did. Um, that being said, we did have to come to some decisions, so come to decisions we did. Um, so I will be announcing uh, our winners for this year. So uh, first, uh, we couldn't, I, I don't think any of us could stick to just three teams. Again, it was all very hard. But um, there was one team that we actually wanted to give an honorable mention to for just how 
good of a job they did during their presentations. I mean, the way that they were just so quick to respond and how prepared they were, we were all very impressed. Um, so we wanna start by giving an honorable mention um, to Liquitricity. It is, it is not an easy task going up against high school teams and you guys really showed up and really held your own. You guys did amazing, so really good job. So we will, we can have teams come up at the end and do photos and stuff afterwards. Um, so then uh, for third place, uh, we decided on a tie. So we have two teams that have third place. Our first third place team in a particular order is Clad Kit. <laughs> really, really nice. And our second third place team is Demeter. So Demeter, let me pull you guys up on the screen. Yay! Nice job. Our second place team for this year is the Nanoframers. <laughs> really nice job. And our first place team this year for Nanovation 2022, congratulations goes to Viking Chill. <laughs> and once again, I have to say really great job to everyone. I, th I think basically every single presentation was on somebody's list somewhere amongst their favorite presentations. So. Again, this was an incredibly tough year, and even if you're not one of the winning teams, you guys are winners today because you did something that high school students do not get to do under normal circumstances. And please take what you've done and what you've learned and run with it and go do amazing, cool things and make new products that are gonna save the world and that we all wanna buy. So really great job to everyone. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, did you want to say something? So, so, so often there is some, there's a bunch of business and a bunch of innovation and a little bit of fantasy in some of these products. And I just want to say thank you guys that every single product was based on sound technology. And that is the coolest thing about the intersection of science and business is that if you have sound technology, you can find a way to make the business work. And so you guys were awesome by really grounding yourself in real tech and then looking at the biggest pic bigger picture. So to everybody, again, they were a really amazing presentation. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, truly, 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 that this was absolutely, I think, the best year. So thank you guys all for making it so amazing. You guys are fantastic. Um, so if you guys are one of the winning teams and you wanted to uh, come up and take a photo, we can do that up here. No, incorrect. Just kidding. <laughs> That's true. Just kidding. Um, and also, uh, for the winning teams, please uh, be sure that you see myself and Denise before you leave so that we can arrange for your prizes. Uh, for all the teams, please make sure that you guys grab a t-shirt and a laser pointer and I think something else that Elaine is holding up in the back. Oh no, those are, your, those are the plaques. Those are the finalist plaques. So if you're a finalist team, please also pick those up. For our third place team, since there's now two of you, you can both take a photo with the trophy and we'll get an extra one made so that you guys will both have a trophy. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so let's flag, so. let's have all the teams come up. Okay, so we'll, I'll just call them in the order that you guys presented in. So well, say, let's get their two photos. Yeah. So so Denise, if you want to come up, or if all the judges, whoever wants to be in the photo, come up. Say two O. You are the first team. 